Hello, everyone. My name is Nicholas Hamasevich, and I'm the Director of Research and Academic Affairs here at KEI. It is my pleasure to welcome you to KEI for our second session of our Emerging Voices on Korea Symposium. Uh, today, we'll be looking at some of South Korea's domestic issues and some of those influences of South Korean foreign policy. We're excited for this program and for this uh, symposium, uh, our Emerging Voices on Korea Symposium. Here at KEI, we're always looking for new voices and new uh, experts on Korea and Korea-related issues. Uh, we do this through a lot of our programs, uh, academic paper series and others. Uh, and this is another way that we're doing that with uh, these graduate students that we have here today. Another part of the reason for this program is here at KEI, we did an academic symposium where we had professors and scholars meet and discuss uh, career-related issues over a couple of days at various uh, schools around the country. And now we are transitioning to do that similar program now with the Association for Asian Studies at their annual conference. And when we did these academic symposiums, we had a, uh, a volume that came out with all the papers that were uh, presented at our symposiums. And this, this joint U.S.-Korea Academic Studies volume was part of that process. And in our transition, we would uh, miss a year uh, this year. So again, another reason to have uh, some great papers from graduate students is so we can have a special edition of this joint U.S.-Korea Academic Studies volume. And so we have the students coming in for, this is the second session we had students in last week, and we'll have students the following week. We'll put all their papers together for a special edition. And part of the uh, reason for them presenting today is so they can get feedback from you all, uh, some ideas, some questions for their papers that they can incorporate back in there and then be able to um, uh, incorporate those into their papers so we can publish that special edition in November. Uh, just another announcement. Uh, unfortunately, Gordon Flake uh, was sick this morning, so he was not able to act as our discussant role. Um, he apologizes for that, uh, so I just want to make that announcement. Let me introduce our speakers for today. Uh, we have some uh, great people here today. So first, we'll have Andrew Kim. Andrew's from New York and graduated from Princeton University in 2010 with a concentration in the Woodrow Wilson School and a certificate in East Asian Studies. He speaks Korean and Chinese. And he was selected as a fellow in the Scholars in the National Service uh, Initiative run by the Woodrow Wilson School. And through this, he returned to Princeton for graduate study uh, in public policy. And he, now he is serving uh, in government for his two years of rotations with the Pentagon and the State Department. And he's currently working on the China and Korea desks at the office of the Secretary of Defense. Next, we'll have... Uh, Jiyun Bang. She is a PhD candidate in the Department of Political Science and International Relations at the University of Southern California. Uh, after her acquiring her master's degree in security studies at Georgetown University, she pursued her passion of Korea at the Korea Institute for Defense Analysis, which is a think tank based in Seoul, South Korea. After her, we'll have Yuk Kyung Che. She uh, received her master and doctorate degree in law from UC Berkeley School of Law in 2008 and then 2011. And she wrote her master's thesis in 2006 uh, at the College of Law at Seoul National University in Korea. She also worked for the Ministry of Justice in South Korea in 2006. And she has been a research assistant at Seoul National University from 2004 to 2007. And she is affiliated with the Center for the Study of Law and Society at UC Berkeley School of Law as a visiting scholar this coming fall. And she will be with the Wa University of Washington next year. And she also serves as an advisor of the California Bar Association International Law Section. And then we'll have Gloria Ku. She is in her second year PhD uh, in the Political Science and International Relations at the University of Southern California. Uh, 
Uh, she studies international political economy with a focus on East Asia. And she grew up in California and worked in Los Angeles as a foreign direct investment liaison for several years. So we'll have um, each of the students come up in that order and present their papers and their ideas. And then we'll, uh, after that, we'll do a question and answer session from uh, the stage. So I'd like to invite Andrew up to start us off. Andrew. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank KEI for uh, giving me this opportunity to share my research, and I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today. Um, I apologize for the disclaimer, but I was told that I need to state that the following presentation represents my personal views only and does not re represent the views of the U.S. government. Um, but with that set aside, uh, my name is Andrew Kim, and the title of my presentation is South Korean National Identity and its Strategic Preferences. So before we jump in, I want to start with a microcosm of a larger trend that uh, I believe has been brewing in Sino-South Korean relations and, and Korean-Japan relations for quite some time. Um, following the Sichuan earthquake in 2008, South Korea became one of the first nations to send aid and condolences uh, to China. And moreover, President Yim myung bak on a state visit made a surprise uh, a visit to the affected area. But the surprising effect was that none of these efforts seemed to gain political traction with the Chinese people. Uh, in fact, Chinese netizens were fixated on a minority of South Korean bloggers who characterized the earthquake as deserved punishment to the Chinese people. And um, this mutual hostility seemed to carry over throughout the year. Uh, with the Olympic torch rally going through Seoul, there were riots that broke out between South Korean and Chinese students. Uh, moreover, into the Olympics themselves, Chinese fans were a common sight uh, rooting against South Korean teams, even when they were facing Japanese teams. Um, and all these trends have sort of solidified into a culture of, a subculture of, of Korea bashing in, in the Chinese internet sphere. In stark contrast, um, the shifts in public sentiment following the Tohoku earthquake were extremely positive between uh, South Korean and Japanese society. As in the case of the Sichuan earthquake, there was a similar minority of South Korean bloggers who characterized the earthquake in Japan as deserved punishment. But what was most surprising was that even former comfort women in South Korea stood up to reprimand uh, those characterizations as damaging. Um, and they reprimanded those inflammatory descriptions that tried to paint the earthquake as retribution for Japan's military past. So what explains this uh, divergence in South Korea's sentiments and perceptions of Japan and, and China? Well, the, the most obvious explanation for this divergence is that it is a byproduct of recent strategic trends in the region. Um, emerging from the 2008 financial crisis in a position of relative strength and combined with the pride and confidence of having successfully hosted the Olympics in Beijing, China seemed to shift toward what many commentators have described as assertive or even aggressive behavior on the international sphere. Uh, much of China's behavior seemed to push Japan and South Korea away from China. The fishing vessel in incident ended in tremendous embarrassment for Japan, and uh, China's recalcitrance in responding to North Korean provocations from the Chunan to Yampyongdo incidents uh, incited rage in South Korea. So all of these strategic external factors uh, seem to point in the same direction as the direction of sentiments among, for, of the South Korean people towards Japanese and, and Chinese society. But are South Korean perceptions only driven by external change? What about internal change? What about how South Korea itself has changed and developed affects its view of the region and its strategic preferences? South Korea itself is not a static variable, and in fact, it has undergone tremendous change over the decades of its development. And likewise, so have the identity and the preferences of the South Korean people. So I argue that a perspective focused on external strategic trends and power configurations alone fails to identify the more subtle domestic and sociological forces that have gradually shaped South Korea's preferences toward favoring Japan over China. To capture these forces, I propose a national identity framework. To elaborate, we begin first with what defines national identity. National identity in any country is generally composed of two distinct components. The first is an ethnic component. This aspect of national identity is primordial and inherited. Uh, it's an intrinsic membership that cannot be gained or or given up. It's the extended family or the nation in, in the term nation state. Civic identity, on the other hand, is often ideational and creedal in nature. More so than simply being an inherited, uh, civic identity is exercised. And it appeals to allegiance not to the nation, but to the state, the political and economic shell that houses 
the, the imagination. So national identity in South Korea, uh, from this perspective, is very unique. Um, Minjok or ethnic identity in South Korea appeals to membership in the homogenous Korean nation. It is what drives the imperative of unification. Minjok identity is what asserts that the current division of the Korean Peninsula and the separation of the Korean people into North and South is an aberration. It's what drives sympathy for the long lost brethren of the North. Kugmin or civic identity in South Korea demonizes the North. Kugmin identity emphasizes the legitimacy of the tangible South Korean state beyond the abstract unified pan-Korean Korean nation. Kugmin identity points to the tangible progress and accomplishments of the South Korean state from Samsung and Hyundai to the World Cup and Pyeongchang instead of Minjok identity's perennial promise of unification and renewed ethnic glory. What makes South Korean national identity unique is that Minjok and Kungmin identity point in such opposite directions. Minjok identity urges South Koreans to fight for unification, save their northern brethren, and defend the nation against transgressors like Japan. Kungmin identity, on the other hand, urges South Korea to marvel at what their half of the peninsula has accomplished, to not risk losing it all to a rogue state on their northern border, and to tighten relations with like-minded democracies like Japan. Civic and ethnic components of national identity naturally exist in tension in, in any case. But in the South Korean case, Minjok and Kungmin identity lead to particularly divergent strategic preferences. So how is ten this tension mediated in South Korea? Minjok identity remains live and well in modern South Korean society, but South Koreans have become decidedly more Southern as opposed to Korean over the course of its development. Initially, Kungmin identity was seen as illegitimate, partially because the founding of South Korea itself was seen as an illegitimate aberration. Um, to be a South Korean citizen only meant that you were primarily anti-North and anti-communist. It was a negatively defined identity, since there wasn't very much to be positively identified for at the time. But through decades of development, the South Korean state has become legitimized in the eyes of the South Korean people. And the promise of a unified Korean nation has become increasingly distant and abstract. Um, Kumin identity invokes not a reminder of illegitimacy now, but it invokes many sources of pride in fields as varied as technological innovation and sports. So, so what does all this say about South Korea's strategic preferences? Applying what we know of Minjok and Kumin identity, we can begin to see the internal societal forces that have been pushing South Korea towards Japan over decades. This idea may be somewhat difficult to accept because in a region notorious for national identity conflicts, the Japan-South Korean case is known to be particularly vitriolic and wide-ranging. From Tokto Takeshima to Comfort Woman to Yasukuni Shrine visits to history textbook controversies, these all remain perennial flashpoints um, because Minjok identity continues to inform the South Korean psyche of Japan's previous transgressions. And I'm not arguing that Minjok identity is going away anytime soon. It is important, though, that the match to, to note that the maturation of Kumin identity in South Korea has begun to act as a counterweight to Minjok identity preferences. The No Koizumi era saw one of the low points of Japan-South Korea relations in modern history. But even that does not compare in scale and intensity to the emotions that were felt in 1965. Uh, while Minjok identity remains a potent reminder of Japan's transgressions, Kumin identity increasing, increasingly fuels affinity with Japan. It points to the substantial similarities between the two nations. They're both democratic, capitalistic, affluent nations and they share a growing list of values and institu institutions. South Korea in the post-war generation, um, South Koreans in the post-war generation have often said that the nation they detest the most is simultaneously the nation that they want South Korea to most emulate. And Kumin identity has tilted this duality from focusing on the first part to the second part. In fact, South Korea has emulated, if not surpassed Japan in many aspects, um, over the past few decades. And this newfound confidence among South Koreans has begun to mitigate the insecurity of Minjok identity and thus improve South Korea's view of Japan. So identity elements have had a long history of interaction in the Japan-South Korea relationship, but they're relatively new in the Sino-South Korean relationship. Sino-South Korean relations started off as a tremendous success story following normalization in 1992. In just over a decade of normalized relations, trade increased 25 times between the two nations. In the height of anti-American sentiments under the Noah administration, 
serious talk of China as a strategic alternative to the United States began to emerge. What was particularly impressive about this relationship was that in an area notorious for historical grievances, the Sino-South Korean relationship remained thoroughly pragmatic and seemed unaffected by traditional national identity conflicts. This all changed, however, in June 2003 um, when researchers of the Chinese government-funded Northeast Project published an article presenting a set of controversial findings on Koguryo's history. The authors boldly stated that the Koguryo Kingdom was in fact an ethnic local government in China's Northeast region, a vassal state to the Chinese dynasty, revising the, tra the traditionally accepted history that Koguryo was a founding kingdom of the Korean nation. So why does this matter? It matters because Koguryo is not just history. It is a foundational element of Minjok identity. As the most powerful and glorious kingdom of Korean history, it is the primary positive reference point that Minjok identity has. It is what informs Koreans that they are not subordinate to the Chinese and that they have independence and a distinct identity to be proud of. To call Koguryo Chinese, therefore, shakes Minjok identity in a very fundamental way. After the Koguryo incident, it was as if Minjok identity insecurities with, chi with China among the Korean people were activated. The South Korean public and media responded radically, and China rapidly went from being viewed as one of the most favored nations in the eyes of the South Korean people to being viewed as one of the ominous, ominous nations in the eyes of the South Korean people. Latent fears of Sinocentrism and anti-Chinese stereotypes um, were revived among, among, within South Korean society. Moreover, Minjok identity seemed to activate Kungmin identity's awareness of China's alien quality. It reminded South Koreans that they had just fought a war with the Chinese communists only half a century ago on the peninsula. And it also reminded South Koreans of their deep differences with China in views of democracy, public health, and human rights. It is evident in South Korea's treatment of many trade disputes with China, from the kimchi to garlic incidents, um, that Kungmin identity has entrenched a sense of moral or value-based superiority over China. Kungmin identity views it as typical that Chinese goods will be contaminated or of lesser quality on a, on a systematic basis. It also remains deeply concerned over China's strategic ambivalence and the threat it may pose to the South Korean state. So going back to um, the outset of this, this, this discussion where we identified the most uh, probable and obvious explanation for dynamics in South Korean public sentiment, um, my, my attempt is not to replace that, that line of thinking, but moreover to complement it, to say that internal factors and internal dynamics that are slow and sociological and often hard to identify have a real impact on the strategic environment and, and what S South Korea does in its foreign policy. Um, and this leads to a broader discussion on the need to think about these factors, these sociological and ideational factors that Take that, that are at play in South Korean society with more analytical rigor uh, and to look at it with a more critical eye than to just label various incidents and developments in, uh, and protests in South Korean society as examples of Korean nationalism or Korean emotionalism. Admittedly, all these factors are, are impossible to quantify and they're difficult to disaggregate into distinct forces that correlate with distinct phases of development and ideational and material change in, in domestic South Korean society. But that doesn't mean that greater clarity can't be uh, injected into this, in this, into this type of thinking to complement um, what a lot of policymakers in, in foreign policy use um, instead of just simply resorting to a realist calculus that there are significant insights that can be found in this domestic approach. So that's the end of my presentation and thank you very much. Hi, I'm Jian, and I'd like to piggyback on what Andrew said about thanking the KEI for giving us such an uh, exciting opportunity, um, and also uh, endowing us with such an intimidating label as that of emerging voices. So I'll do my best. Um, the topic, uh, today's topic for, for my presentation is aligned but not allied. 
Rock Japan Bilateral Military Cooperation. And this harks back to a phrase that is often used, allies by proxy, in describing Rock and Japan in relation to the US. Uh, so just a brief outline of what I'll talk about today. Uh, the significance of my study followed by a very brief history of bilateral military relations. I'll talk about the literature review, uh, go over my research design for the paper, discuss some findings, and end with uh, implications for the future. So the burning question behind every uh, paper or presentation is, why should I care about uh, what you're doing? Um, why does it deserve my attention? So what did I do? Um, I, I covered, my question was how realism accounts for the instances of bilateral military cooperation between the two countries. And uh, in my mind, uh, the significance of my study is threefold. First, um, it's very convenient to say the Northeast Asian region is um, shrouded by realist thinking and quote unquote the last vestiges of the Cold War, so to speak. But there's been a lack of systematic empirical study to establish such a relationship. And so that's what I try to do in my paper. And second, uh, somewhat similar to Andrew, um, I, the interaction between domestic and foreign policy had not been applied to the issue of bilateral military cooperation. So that was another contribution. And lastly, um, I feel like in the agency versus structure debate, um, my topic has a lot of room for agency in that we're not talking about North Korea, what will it do with North Korea, the six party talks, will it start up again? We're talking about something that Seoul and Tokyo could do here and now, right now. Um, so there's a lot of agency involved. So a brief history, um, a refresher hopefully, um, about why bilateral military cooperation had been stunted between the two countries. I think there were three reasons. The first was there was sensitivity on the part of South Korea given its history of annexation by Japan. And second, there were reservations on both Japan and South Korea against any indication of Japanese remilitarization. And third, uh, both states were very wary against unnecessarily stirring uh, North Korea. So a very brief literature review, um, who said what on this topic? So what do people see as a driver and or the obstacle to um, uh, bilateral military cooperation between South Korea and Japan? Uh, some people, the first camp is uh, cites North Korea. So this is the realist camp. And they cite factors such as deterrence um, and that deterrence helps bring the two countries together, so to speak. And then the, you have the more constructivist camp that cites history as an obstacle to cooperation. So they talk about identities and feelings and memories and history, obviously. And third, you have the more uh, positive uh, liberalist or econophoriacs uh, that uh, cites sort of a interest-driven, not a threat-driven approach to the relationship. And last, you have uh, the analytical eclecticism, if you will, of the hybrid camp that cites different elements from different camps. So what research design did I employ for my paper? First, I made very important distinctions. The first was opting for military as opposed to security. In my mind, security meant looking also at um, high level meetings between political or politicians and officials, which meant uh, looking at rhetoric. And rhetoric is very hard to parse out. So I only looked at interactions between military um, to military. And I also opted for cooperation as opposed to exchange, because exchange for me meant uh, more of a transitory um, thing. So the synthesis could be more functional than um, substantive. And I only looked at bilateral, so just South Korea and Japan, as opposed to multilaterals, so um, PSI or RIMPAC, all that. Uh, I try to isolate the effects of other actors, especially the US. So I only looked at multi uh, bilateral cooperation. And the time period was from 1990 to 2010. And 1990 because, um, before then is just too much data, but also because uh, I think 1990 is when the relations really picked up. So that's when it really got going. So I um, constructed four different data sets. The first was of all the instances of military cooperation, which amounted to 35, <coughs> which is admittedly a bit of a small end. So um, I can talk about that later in the Q&A session. Uh, 
And the second was all the instances of North Korean provocations. This is the realist camp, which I found 98 of. And then the third, the list of bilateral disputes of 104. And fourth, the bilateral trade. And here I took a cue from Russet and O'Neill uh, that talk about economic interdependence. And they use the indicator of trade as a share or of one's GDP as economic interdependence. And that's the indicator I used. And so after getting the data, I, I coded the three timelines, um, just for convenience. So these are uh, nominal, not ordinal, but you could certainly maybe use it in an ordinal fashion. But um, so you have military cooperation from one to five, uh, provocations, so you have skirmishes, as espionage, nuclear tests, et cetera, and bilateral disputes, um, as Andrew, Andrew mentioned, history issues, territory, Yasukuni shrine visits and so on. So my immediate finding was that there were five repeated peaks uh, post-98. And I realized that this coincided with the search and rescue exercises, which is the most institutionalized instance of military cooperation between the two states uh, right now. And the increase you see towards the end uh, is the amalgamation of the other institutionalized form, which is joint Coast Guard exercises. and. Keeping this in mind, um, I basically found three general findings from the data sets. First is that North Korean provocations do tend to foster bilateral military cooperation. So if you look at the data sets, um, 2009 and 2010, which had the greatest temporal overlap between um, the military cooperation and provocation, affirmed uh, finding one, and as did 95 and 96. But the condition conditionality here is that I think um, provocations of the more symbolic kind, so missile tests or nuclear tests, along with those that resulted in fatalities, uh, were more often re uh, reciprocated in military cooperation as opposed to, say, if you look at 2001, you have a very high peak in the number of provocations. but. These are uh, mainly very minor um, incursions across the NNL or um, those that resulted in no uh, casualties at all. So finding two was that a large asymmetry between econo economic trade may hamper uh, bilateral military cooperation. If you look at 2000, um, where you see the sharpest uh, discrepancy between uh, ROK share, uh, trade as ROK share of the GDP and Japan's GDP, um, there was no instance of military cooperation. And also, it's interesting, towards the end, you see a large, um, I'm not sure, maybe too many colors, but towards the end, there's a large discrepancy in trade as a share of Japan's GDP and trade as a share of ROK's GDP. And I think this may suggest that um, the two are economically interconnected, but not necessarily economically interdependent. Um, maybe I could explore this further, but I have yet to do so. And finding three is that bilateral disputes on average have a neutral effect on bilateral military cooperation. And if you look at these three periods, they all have different numbers of uh, cooperation and different numbers of disputes. So I think, uh, personally, I think it's just the consistency in the disputes throughout the years have sort of become background noise. So it's very hard to decipher or parse out the effects of disputes. Uh, maybe if I had a much larger N, I could do so, but it's difficult at this point. So after this, I decided to look at two specific years, 2000 and 2001. Um, and the rationale for picking these two years were that, number one, they had no bilateral military cooperation, and number two, they showed the sharpest trade asymmetry, and three, they had different compositions in provocations and disputes. And I also, uh, uh, inserted 1999, but that was the logic was that spillover effects could be important. So what happens in 1999 could uh, affect 2000, and 2000 could affect 2001, and so on. Uh, not you probably couldn't read this, but just to show you what I did, I collected uh, all the events that occurred during the three years, um, internal to both countries, uh, external, so regionally, state level, and uh, on a systemic level. Um, so globally, what was going on. So this is 1999, this is 2000, and this is 2001. So the bottom line of the focus case study was that 
an increase in confidence in leadership and capacity of the state to engage with this external environment uh, tended to lead to a decrease in bilateral military cooperation. And just to see if this hunch was not just a hunch, I looked at approval ratings of the leadership, and at the time it was Kim Dae-jung and Ko Izumi. And um, the Asahi Shimbun approval ratings seem to confirm the finding that he was very uh, relatively popular and retrospectively is the only prime minister to have served more than five years since 72. And Kim Dae-jung at the time, uh, before the scandals, at the time, um, his sunshine policy, he was riding the wave of his sunshine policy and he had done the Kim came into Korea summit. Um, so implications for the future, just as a synthesis of everything. Um, the top three are those that are on the rise or have been rising, and the bottom two are those that are decreasing or are decreasing. And the one on the brackets um, show, the signs show whether they have a positive or a negative impact on bilateral military cooperation. And so I think in all, I would like to, um, in the sentiment of Andrew, say tentatively mm -hmm. that cooperation between Seoul and Tokyo will increase. Um, but I'm not in the business of prediction, so don't quote me on that. Uh, so to sum up, I think at the end of the day, it was more eclecticism that explains the instances of military cooperation between the two countries. So yes, you do see realism um, and the driver of DPRK provocations, but you also have the more liberalist factor of trade and I, the... Uh, factor of confidence and state capacity. And that is all. Thank you so much for listening. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I appreciate also uh, for the Korea Economics Institute for inviting me to DC to present a paper. And I'm very glad to, glad to um, have you all um, here, um, even though I miss Mr. Gordon's sake as he discussed it. Um, today, um, I'm going to talk about the reform of the legal profession um, of Korea from 1995 to 2007. Uh, in the late 20th century, um, legal reform came to dominate the national agendas of Northeast Asian countries. Beginning in 1993, demands for judiciary independence and access to justice system arose in Korea as well. My original project investigates all of these issues. Um, however, um, today I will focus on politics conflicts, political conflicts uh, that culminates in the establishment and the management of the Legal Professional Graduate School Act of Korea, which I call LPGS Act hereafter. Um, uh, the post-1987 democratic leaders and their administrations brought uh, legal reform as a critical national agenda in Korea. Regarding reform of the legal profession, I have divided the whole period from 1995 to 2007 into three named period one, two, and three, respectively. Among several questions that I have addressed, I will raise just two main questions today. First, why did the third effort to reform the Korean legal profession succeed? while the previous two reform efforts failed. In seeking explanations, the study um, suggested answers to the second and the most important set of questions. Who were involved in, in reform of the legal profession? And what were their roles? What did they gain? Or what did they lose? The pre-reform legal profession trained a uh, legal professional training system consisted of national judicial examination plus uh, the additional two-year apprenticeship at the Judicial Research and Training Institute, the JRTI. However, only extremely small numbers had been admitted to the bar, and those who had been trained for the state bureaucracy were mostly serving as judges or prosecutors rather than as practicing attorneys. The pass rate of the judicial exam um, were notoriously low, that it reached below three to five percent. Naturally, extremely small number of legal profession enjoyed enormous social, political, and economic power, uh, monopolizing the legal market. 
Through the LPGS Act, a new postgraduate professional law school system was substituted for four-year undergraduate legal education as a reform effort succeeded in large part in July 2007. According to the um, LPGS Act, the Legal Education Committee under the Ministry of Education kept the total number of new law school students at 2,000 who were distributed among 25 universities nationwide. 15 are located in, in Seoul, um, while 10 are decentralized to non-Seoul area uh, by the government. As of April 2009, the new Bar Exam Act was also enacted, and the Ministry of Justice finalized only the first year of 2012 um, pass rate of the new Bar Exam at 75%. This table um, briefly shows that uh, the ratio of uh, population per lawyers in Korea before the reform. In 1995, uh, reformists emphasized legal reform, which included raising the standards for competitive legal professionals on the occasion of Korea's entry um, into the World Trade Organization. Reformists especially sought improvements in the legal professional training system, suggesting um, the introduction of the U.S.-style law school in Korea. Despite the apparent popularity um, of the reform idea, uh, reform of the legal profession failed due to the strong op oppositions of judges, prosecutors, and pra practicing attorneys. Subsequently, in 1998, Kim Dae-jung's uh, administration again raised the issue of reform of the legal profession to bring more professionalism to the practicing bar. In period two, the um, new education community reform committee, it's a bit long, uh, NECRC, was established. Many uh, consist of small group of social legal scholars having proposed to introduce not the U.S. law school system, but a Koreanized graduate legal education system. However, the Ministry of Justice, represented by high-ranked prosecutors, pushed the president to establish a separate presidential uh, judicial reform committee, suggesting to slightly modify the existing system rather than adopting a postgraduate law school in Korea. The second reform also failed um, as the reformist encountered severe opposition, mostly from establishing legal professionals that is, administration's effort also fell short of um, the expectations of the law school advocates once um, again. Um, at each, re uh, each level of decision, however, um, the agencies that I call here, especially the legal professionals and law professors, consistently uh, raised arguments, sometimes contradicting themselves. I have been tracing those players, um, mainly focusing on the shift in position um, by key agencies. There are the administration, the Ministry of Justice, the Supreme Court, the Korean Bar Association, Legal Academia, NGOs, especially um, People's Solidatory for Participatory Democracy, Chamayande, and the public. Uh, for today's presentation, however, um, I will focus on the Supreme Court's role and its shift. Um, the election of uh, the young and reformative President No Myan and the shift in the position of the Supreme Court after much public pressure for the reform propelled um, reform of the legal profession since 2003 in um, Korea. Um, the No Myan Administration renewed a push um, for reform of the legal profession in 2003. Reform looked possible because um, in the previous year, um, the Supreme Court finally had promised to countenance the reform um, um, of the um, legal professional training system. The ex executive branch entrusted the Supreme Court with power to lead the reform. In 2003, the Judicial Reform um, Committee, which I call here JRC, was established directly under the Supreme Court and it drafted the LPGS Act in 2007. 
During um, period three, the Judicial Reform Committee was run from August 2003 until the end of 2004. And then the Presidential Committee on the Judicial Reform um, System uh, implemented the JRC's recommendation through drafting bills until the end of 2006. Through um, intensive um, vol and voluminous interviews and archive research, um, but I have found that there was a missing link between period two and three before the JRC uh, was established. <coughs> From that moment, I have paid much, atten much attention on the Supreme Court um, because the JRC was run directly um, by the Supreme Court, unlike um, other legal reform committees run by um, the administration. I hope you like it. <laughs> um, under authoritarian regimes, um, the Korean judiciary was never in a position to keep other political um, entities in check. The president and executives um, had substantial power over the appointment and tenure of judges. They intervened in judicial affairs, um, influencing cases with political implications and excluding those perceived as uncooperative uh, and in carrying out the administration's political agendas. Courts were reluctant to confront the ex executive branch in response to social uh, change, the passive judiciary had been conservative and um, unenthusiastic about taking the initiative to reform the legal system. But through um, the three times reformative waves, both internal and external factors um, brought the Supreme Court's shift, according to my uh, research. Internally, um, judges had developed their own arguments about law school reform based on their own research and studies, while prosecutors and practicing attorneys kept opposing to the reform. Since the Judicial um, Policy Research Department, JR, JPRD, was established under the National Court of Administration, NCA, it has, been, uh, it has been manned by the most promising and brightest young judges um, since 1994. It has, um, on the other hand, younger generation who were more Americanized and less conservative had a better appreciation on the US style legal system. As the um, NCA maneuvered judges into studying abroad, especially um, the United States since the 1990, uh, since, the, since the late 1990s, judges have con conducted in-depth research um, obtaining first-hand experience on the US legal system. They were more sensitive to the reform than uh, prosecutors, practicing attorneys, or other conservative old judges. They were also open-minded about communicating with legal scholars um, who have consistently proposed to introduce a postgraduate legal education system in Korea. Externally, um, it has been also debated that the appointment system for judges should be reformed to the election system. Um, one reason for this debate was, it, was that judges and the judiciary had been criticized for their authoritative or bureaucratic characteristics that might have been formed by the military authoritarian regimes from the 1960s through the 1980s. During period three, there was a remarkable political event which is called forced judicial crisis in Korea. Reformists have demanded that the nomination of the Supreme Court justice no longer resides exclusively in the hand of uh, the Chief Justice. However, at the time, the Chief Justice Choi jong young would conventionally nominate a Gwangju High Court judge and he ignored nominations from um, citizen groups of potential nominees who were younger and more diverse than the senior candidates. On August 12, 2003, the president of the Korean Bar Association and the minister of the Ministry of Justice walked away during the nomination um, committee meeting. On the next day, one confident judge um, held a press conference and resigned for the conventional practice uh, of the Supreme Court. A compact under um, the joint signature of 159 junior judges was circulated, um, demanding the judicial reform. Since this, this accident, 
the Supreme Court stepped back to word of the criticism from um, the then current public opinion. It appeared that the Supreme Court made an effort to avoid um, introducing the election system and maintain the authority, uh, authority to nominate judges. Instead, it gave uh, up the JRTI, uh, which used to be run by the Supreme Court, and compromised by introducing the law school system, which would not hurt uh, its position as severely. In conclusion, um, based on its own research and study, the Supreme Court seemed to conclude um, that the Korean legal system could become more adversarial than bureaucratic um, through the US-style legal professional training system. Courts realized that the reform would not harm the status of existing judges. Moreover, the Supreme Court um, took the main lead of the reform during period three, protecting their own interests, limiting the size of the legal profession, um, etc. Even if the number of lawyers increased um, under the post-reform system, the Supreme Court seemed to predict that the judiciary would, re uh, would maintain its, its small size and law school graduate and experienced lawyers would still aspire to join the judiciary. The prosecutors, on the other hand, would lose the power that they had enjoyed under the pre-reform system. Thus, um, through the introduction of the new law school system, the prosecutor groups um, appears to have been weakened more than the judiciary. The Supreme Court um, concluded that the new system would probably make the judiciary less likely to succumb to the power of the prosecutors, thereby strength strengthening the judiciary. Wrapping up today's um, presentation, uh, I, did, um, I, I did analyze all of the other agencies in this way, but I cannot um, present all of them, but uh, I'm expecting to talk about it um, um, based on your questions. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Gloria Ku, and thank you to um, Korea Economic Institute as well as all of you for coming. In the presentation title, The Dollar Dependence, Dollar Influence in East Asia Benevolent or Overbearing, a comparative answer in the U.S. economic aid and dollar standard, I uh, examine the changing nature of the dollar influence in East Asia. And in order to guide us, uh, our discussion, I set up a theoretical framework of uh, concepts of power and hierarchy as they are often discussed in the fields of political science and international relations. Uh, power and economic hierarchy uh, are often manifested in the dollar um, uh, given as massive economic aid as well as dollar standard as currency anchors are adopted. Within this framework, I more specifically look at the cases of Korea and Taiwan. In the written paper that I submitted, I talked about both cases, but for today's presentation, I will focus only on Korea. Um, so building upon this discussion of dollar influence, I go on to assess the how uh, the influence has been overbearing or benevolent. A long story short, the dollar influence has been benevolent in a sense that it uh, provided stability and transactional convenience as well as a closer relationship with the U.S. On the other hand, it um, has been overbearing in a sense that it kind of uh, caused a loss of political autonomy over domestic economic management, as well as exposed uh, the recipient country of the influence to risks of economic fluctuations or shocks. In this context, I also found that the relationship between uh, the U.S. as a giver and Korea as a recipient of the influence um, has changed over the years. Back in the 50s and 70s, um, when the massive economic aid was given, uh, the relationship between the giver and recipient grew or um, emerged uh, more out of um, a dire need. U.S. was following Cold War politics, and Korea needed the capital to recover from the war as well as to finance its industrialization. But in a more recent decades, um, when um, the currency anchors are manifestations of the dollar influence the relationship is uh, chosen into. Both economies see the benefit of um, stability and convenience um, for, the stabil uh, for the stability of the dollar standard. As we get ready. Okay. Um, and similarly, I also conjecture that um, Korea's approach to dollar influence has changed somewhat. Korea moved from being a receptive beneficiary to being a proactive undertaker of the influence. I conclude uh, today's presentation by exploring um, 
the present and the future uh, interest, how the questions um, emerge and how what we should consider as we go into the future. So far, the dollar anchor has proved beneficial, but as inter-Asia regional trade rises and as the value of the US dollar as an anchor currency decreases um, its attractiveness, interests of Korea may diverge in the future. Will dollar standard be still be attractive? If not, what are other viable political um, alternatives? I see the presentation on my monitor, but I don't see anything, so I'll just continue. Um, so that is how I will proceed with the presentation. Um, so first of all, I will uh, begin with laying out, oh, here it is, woohoo, thank you. So um, this is how I will uh, proceed as a recap, as you can all read. And so I will uh, begin with laying out a theoretical concept of power and hierarchy. Uh, power is a main driver in international politics, a central uh, concept in the study of political science. Scholars define power as an ability to act freely, insulated from outside pressures, uh, to promote key national goals. Power can be relational in a sense that it can coerce compliance, it can also be structural in a sense that it, determine, uh, it determines the uh, structure of the global political economy. Uh, uh, scholars Cohen and Nye defined power, captured power as patterns of asymmetrical interdependence between actors. Similar to power, a related concept is hierarchy. In a hierarchical relationship, a dominant state um, uses its commanding power position to coerce acquiescence or participation of the subordinate state. The subordinate state uh, benefits from a social order provided by the dominant state, but in exchange gives up a measure of its own autonomy. In a sense, hierarchical authority can be understood not so much as a law that's imposed, but more of a contract that is entered into, especially in the present day. In practice, economic hierarchy can manifest through monetary dependence on economic aid, as well as currency anchors that are adopted by the, com by the countries. A case in point would be Korea. In 1950s and 60s, e uh, US economic aid was given with conditionality. It wasn't free, but it, was, um, it came with leverage uh, for the US part. In the 50s and 60s, uh, the US government uh, presented Korea with massive amount of economic aid. In the 50s alone, um, an estimated amount of $4,364 million were given in aid, uh, loans and grants, that is in addition to military ad aid um, given in uh, personnel, technology, and weaponry. It's estimated that about $270 million per year uh, which was given to Korea, which amounted to about $12 per capita, 15% uh, of the gross national product. And it's also estimated that about 70% of uh, Korea's total imports was financed by the US government. But this all did not come freely. Uh, it came with conditionality. It came with leverage. The US government often threatened to hold back the aid in order to coerce uh, budgetary uh, or economic reforms, uh, political reforms in the Korean government. The United States Agency of International Development um, often uh, forced the Park regime to undertake budgetary monetary discipline and to devalue the one. Because of these uh, frequent interventions, Korea's autonomy, autonomy was often in question. In the late 1960s, although explicit aid stopped, the US maintained much influence on, on Korea as well as East Asia as a close military ally and a major trade partner. In the more recent decades, 90s and uh, 2000, the dollar influence continues uh, in Korea, as Korea closely pegs the one to dollar and holds a, a large currency reserves in the US dollar. On one hand, the dollar standard provides exchange rate stability and transactional convenience. This is especially so because the US is a large export market for Korean products, and a high proportion of international trade activities are uh, invoiced in dollars. <coughs> But in the 90s, dollar weight in the Korean uh, currency regime basket was as high as 97%. After the Asian financial crisis in the late 90s and early 2000s, the uh, dollar weight uh, reached about 85%. A stable link to the US dollar harmonized the nominal uh, currency values and removed exchange rate variations. Um, but this stability is not without risks. 
On one, on the other hand, uh, so continuing on with that, uh, currencies are largely pegged to the dollar, are vulnerable to um, ext extraneous currency fluctuations and financial crises that involve the dollar. So if not managed carefully, uh, pegging to a single anchor currency can be economically risky. As for regional concern, uh, fluctuations of nominal exchange rates can lead to sharp variations of international competitiveness. Um, if the dollar becomes unstable or loses value, pegging to the dollar and holding large reserves in the dollar can significantly um, destabilize or have very significant destabilizing effects in East Asian economies, especially Korea. So to recap, the dollar influence has been benevolent in a sense that it, uh, for the benefits of stability, convenience, and a closer relationship with the U.S. But on the other hand, it hasn't been overbearing because it causes a loss of political autonomy over domestic um, economic as well as political management. And also the country that um, is susceptible to the influence is um, exposed to external economic shocks or fluctuations. In the context, I also saw that relationship uh, that's, that's giving and receiving the influence is in flux. In the decades of economic aid, um, it was driven more out of need. Um, the key words are Cold War politics, war recovery, and industrialization. But in the, area, uh, in the era of currency anchors, uh, the, the relationship is driven more for positive benefits of convenience and stability. So both actors, uh, in a way, choose into this relationship. Um, similarly, Korea's approach to dollar influence has changed somewhat. In the 50s and 60s, when Korea had to receive the capital in order to industrialize, uh, Korea was a receptive beneficiary of the needed capital. But in the recent decades, uh, Korea is more of a proactive actor that pursues a convenience and stability. Korean government chooses a dollar weight in its re uh, currency basket. So what now? Um, while the U.S. dominance uh, was very visible and apparent in the military uniforms and dollar deposits in 50s and 60s and 70s, but now it's more behind the scenes of uh, in international currency markets. The rationale for the hierarchy for the uh, U.S. hegemony or U.S. influence um, is that the dominant state provides an acceptable social order, in this case economic stability. But that the U.S. can continue to um, successfully provide economic stability, in other words, whether the U.S. Um, hegemony can continue, whether dollar influence can be benevolent or overbearing, uh, remains to be seen. The trade-off between economic stability and political autonomy, uh, the management of risks and benefits and costs of the dollar influence has to be weighed very carefully. Um, if not, if the, the dollar influence is not uh, benevolent, what would Korea do? What would be other alternatives? So let me conclude by saying that uh, keeping in mind the growing importance of inter-Asia regional trade and the decreasing attractiveness of dollar as an anchor currency, how to hedge against a U.S. risk um, is the ultimate challenge that encumbers Korea of today and tomorrow. Thank you. All right, well, let me uh, just take a couple minutes to just co make a couple comments to get you uh, about the papers to get you thinking about the papers as well and come up with some of your own questions and comments. I mean, it's very interesting for um, these papers with South Korea, you know, and the in the in South Korea's development, um, all the different factors that go into its development and uh, go into uh, a country that is a, a rising country and a rising influence in Northeast Asia. And so we have. You know, identity, um, its relationship with Japan, uh, legal reform, and, and the economy and, and the dollar. It, it really does describe kind of how, um, uh, as a developing, as a moving into from a developing to a developed country, South Korea has a lot of factors and a lot of influences that we can follow. And, and I think it's important for a lot of the younger scholars um, that we have to um, be able to uh, enhance the scholarship by looking at some of these issues. Uh, for Andrew's paper, I think uh, definitely the national identity um, is often sometimes linked with soft power and how, especially in Washington, how we see soft power and national identity issues coming together. Um, so I think the interesting thing for his paper is the identity versus uh, nationalism and how uh, 
the two different identities that he mentions uh, really can start, you can start to um, focus in on both of them and then really figure out which part is nationalism, separate out which part is nationalism. Uh, I think it'll be interesting to you know, see, I know you, it was more kind of on toward Japan and uh, China, but it's also interesting to see kind of how um, the South Korea, the identity that talks about South Korea and the successes of South Korea, how that affects um, unification and how it would move toward unification. For uh, Junes, um, very a lot of compilation of data. So when when her paper when we publish her paper, I encourage you to look through it because she does go through a lot of newspaper articles, um, meetings, and different events, and kind of puts them all into the charts as you saw. Um, and she has she does a good job of defining what she means um, with her, like she talked about military um, exchange and her other um, terms. The interesting thing, kind of, and again, connecting it with Andrew's paper is um, talked about search and rescue and Coast Guard um, and how these, like you talked about in your paper, you, both countries were very wary of um, not uh, trying to uh, scare North Korea or be perceived as being totally against North Korea. So you have search and rescue, Coast Guard, these type of things where um, they won't be perceived as as uh, aggressive or, or uh, against North Korea, but it's also kind of in the in the realm now with military military being a, a, an arm of soft power in these type of search and rescue, uh, Coast Guard, humanitarian relief. Um, so I think that's an interesting factor, and, and so it might be something you can talk about or uh, look at in your paper. The differences between you know search and rescue, Coast Guard versus exercises, the mil straight up military exercises. Um, military exchanges uh, with personnel uh, and meetings. For Yu Kyung's paper on legal reform, um, it's interesting as well. She doesn't touch on it, but it really is uh, a little bit throughout her paper uh, identity of South Korea. You know, what do South Koreans want to see their legal um, framework be? Do they want it to be like the U.S. system, or do they think that their own system can be um, beneficial for their own society? So that's an interesting part that, um, even though it's not talked about as identity, but it's, it's throughout the paper as far as each of the different agencies that she lists, kind of debating where they see South Korea's uh, legal society being and how closely it should relate to the U.S. Um, it'd be interesting, and I'm glad you picked out the Supreme Court because I think that was one of the most interesting parts of her paper was the the trend and uh, the reasoning for the Supreme Court either backing legal reform or kind of um, holding back a little bit on legal reform. So I think I'm glad you pointed that out. Uh, it'd be interesting to maybe talk about a little bit about it is um, the restricting on the number of lawyers. I thought this was interesting and maybe you can go through kind of some of the different uh, agencies that you mentioned and, and reasoning on why they would restrict the number of lawyers or why they thought the numbers of uh, lawyers should be capped at certain numbers. Um, and then for Gloria, uh, a good overview of uh, kind of the U.S. Uh, influence and, and U.S. Uh, dollar and aid to Korea. I think um, maybe to help us out a little bit, maybe your definition of overbearing and kind of what you um, saw or, or put in that your definition of overbearing for uh, Korea. So with that, I just wanted to open it up maybe to some questions or comments, and then we can uh, uh, go from there, and you can either address some of the comments and address some of mine as well. So just uh, raise your hand. We have a couple microphones, and just uh, state your name for us and your affiliation. We much appreciate it. So start us off. Troy, start us off for us. Thanks. Troy Saron with the Korea Economic Institute. Uh, my question is for Gloria. Um, I guess maybe if you could take in, in your paper sort of draw out um, kind of what you're looking for in terms of autonomy and the role of the dollar. Because um, the reason I think about this is that if you look at, for example, I guess the U.S. Uh, the U.S. isn't actually autonomous if you think about it as well. Um, most people during the crisis have talked about the need for the U.S. to export more, but one of the keys to that is a depreciation of the dollar to make U.S. exports more competitive. Uh, 
but because of the dollar's role in the national system, uh, basically other countries tend to fight that. So the U.S. isn't autonomous in its own policies. So I guess, I guess if you could sort of talk about how you see the autonomy issue playing out and sort of what your solution is in the sense of do you believe it's a factor of the U.S. dollar specifically or in the sense that another country's currency as the reserve currency would make things different or that it's simply a factor of the system and that any currency is basically irreplaceable within that system? Thank you. Big bundle of questions. Um, you're right. Uh, U.S. is not auton completely autonomous because it has a burden of being the dominant currency, and um, China or Asian countries will feel uh, not so happy if the U.S. Uh, dollar is depreciated. Um, but at the same time, I think the dollar enjoyed its presence as dominant currency. Um, it's kind of shielded from, let's say, exchange rate uh, fluctuations or other crises that are affect that occur in outside dollar zone. So in a way, it's enjoy the dominant position. But as we go on for, well, if I look at it from the East Asian perspective, um, I think Korean won or Taiwan dollar um, had to adjust um, because of dollar, um, according to dollar movements, not necessarily for its own domestic economic positions. So in a way, um, they were not autonomous in a sense that they had to adjust and they had to adjust their domestic economic uh, conditions or policies in order to match the currency um, valuations. So that's what I meant by not having so much autonomous, um, not having so much autonomy. Um, and I guess I, w I would also have to say that it's, it is systematic because they have been part of a dollar block for so long and I think it'll be hard for them to um, completely be driving away from it or um, de drastically decreasing the dollar weight in their um, basket. Uh, but at the same time, I think they need to think of um, alternative ways to um, be more independent, uh, kind of shield their economies from uh, financial crises that involve the dollar, that originate from the dollar uh, fluctuations. So that's what I mean by um, autonomy, like for, for them to be able to uh, shield from, uh, be shielded from the crises or be protected so they can be independently uh, safe or risk, uh, decrease their risks. That's all the questions right here. Yeah. Um, Priscilla Beck with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Um, I have a question for Andrew, uh, actually two questions. Um, you differentiate between the internal and external factors that are shaping the strategic preferences for, for Korea. Um, could you elaborate a little more um, on examples of external factors that you think that is the general kind of, uh, you know, what people generally think are shaping those strategic preferences? And um, I know your argument was that we need to focus more on those internal factors. So if you could, you know, give a little background. And also, second, um, I've noticed um, that there are generational differences, too, um, with yeah, I guess this concept of kumin and minjok identity. Um, if you can expound on what you think, um, how, how the generational kind of uh, factor also plays into um, those strategic preferences, that would be, uh, yeah, that's my question. Um, those are both great points. Um, with regards to your first question on external factors, um, what I'm trying to fight against is this tendency uh, for people to look at South Korea as a puzzle, and to, that that they're trying to conform what they see to some broader theoretical model, that they make certain assumptions about states as rational actors, that they you know they think that strategic dynamics are determined by power configurations, um, very realist basic assumptions. I think they're very valid and they're very important to have in mind, but I think they're simplistic and incomplete by themselves. So that was sort of uh, the point I was trying to make um, in the case for looking at the internal dynamics that are often harder to identify. Uh, with regards to the generational gap, I think that um, is a point uh, very well taken. I think there are huge generational gaps and how generations mediate the tension between ethnic and civic components of their identity. I think particularly um, in the younger generation, you for the first time have a genuinely South Korean generation that's grow up that grew up in affluence, that grew up in a democratic South Korea, that grew up enjoying these democratic institutions, rule of law, um, free elections, 
and that has a profound influence on how they the, the kind of country that they they want South Korea to be and the kind of citizens that they want to be and that has ripple effects into uh, what kind of foreign policy they want South Korea to have um, so um, yeah that's that's definitely a point well taken Right. So, um, sort of feeding off of what Nick, one of one of Nick's comments on implications for something like unification, um, I think unification as a principle is sacrosanct. That every Korean child who goes to elementary school will be taught that a unified Korean Peninsula is the ideal scenario, and everyone will pay, you know, will acknowledge that. But in terms of willingness to sort of pursue that, and to what extent they be able, they be willing to sacrifice things that they currently enjoy. I think there's a tremendous difference between what sentiments were in the 1950s and what they are now among the younger generation. Korea has a lot to lose now. It's it's a huge economy. It's a thriving society, and it has really developed and gained a lot of achievements on the international stage. You know, just that political entity below the 38th parallel. And when you ask South Koreans, you know, today, do you agree with unification as a principle? Absolutely. If you ask them, do you want unification to happen tomorrow, they're a lot more hesitant because they have the South Korean state has produced tangible goods. Maybe uh, Jean, you could talk. Maybe um, I don't know if you talk about some of the difference between the search and rescue versus military exercises overall. Kind of how you saw that in your um, paper and trying to work through the, some of those issues. Um, unfortunately, I don't make a distinction in the nature of the military, military to military, so the search and rescue exercises by the navies and then the joint coast guard exercises within the coast guards. Um, I think once I, what I was afraid of was the, the small end problem, which I briefly touched upon. There's just not a lot of instances of military to military um, cooperation, bilateral military cooperation. And um, you're right in the sense that because there is the variable of North Korea, you don't want to do, obviously, um, say, large simulations, um, the ones you sort of do with the US that become sort of symbolic and gets to be ammunition for North Korea to, in which they attack um, Japan or uh, South Korea or US with. Um, so I'm not, I'm not quite sure how much I would gain from making that distinction, per se. Um, I just feel like it would take the focus even further out. Uh, I'd be branching out too many branches in my paper, and it might um, be just too much for me to handle. But I will definitely um, see if something comes out of it. It's a very good point. Maybe you can maybe talk about some of the um, issues for um, restricting the number of lawyers and what you found between the agencies there. Yeah, that's the actual point to restrict the number of lawyers um, for not only for the legal professionals, but also the government and legal academia. And the legal academia and the public side consistently um, insist um, give up uh, restricting the number of lawyers um, during the whole period of reform. But the legal professionals really wants to um, and trust I and mean, believes that they, they sh the number should be restricted. So there is a just controversial um, debates on that point. Um, but I mean, the Korean um, legal education system has been transformed in 2007, um, while Japan also transformed it in 2004. And Japan allowed uh, a lot of law schools in the beginning. And uh, the, their new bar exam actually pass rate is very low now. So during the Korean legal profession reform, the reformists and the legal professionals um, had more voices um, um, to that we have to um, still limit the number of lawyers. So, um, but in my personal uh, kind of view is that if really Korea wants to to um, raise the legal professionals like the U.S. Uh, in the and the, in the globalized market, um, the restriction on the number should be gradually um, um, avoided. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, 
Sarah Yoon with KEI. Uh, I have a question for Chian. You mentioned three factors that affect uh, or affect the, the increase or the decrease of rock Japan military cooperation, North Korea publication, trade asymmetry, and also the strength of leadership. Uh, North Korea publication, uh, that's that seems evident, um, self-evident, but how exactly do you think trade asymmetry and strength of leadership or state capacity influences the rise or the decrease of military cooperation? Thank you. So did I understand your question correctly in saying you're asking about the dynamics of how trade asymmetry and state uh, confidence affects bilateral military cooperation? So my assumption on trade asymmetry was that the sharper the trade asymmetry or the uh, shared vulnerability, because that's what I'm talking about when I talk about economic interdependence, it should be uh, a similar level of shared vulnerability um, of the trade for both ROK and Japan. And um, if you saw th uh, in the graph that I had, um, in 2000 there was a very sharp asymmetry in the bilateral trade as a share of ROK's GDP and the trade as a share of Japan's GDP. And that's when I saw no bilateral military cooperation. So my assumption was that the greater the symmetry, um, the uh, lower the, uh, or the lack thereof or bi of bilateral military cooperation. But I guess the, the f I guess you're asking about the very finite dynamics of how exactly trade maybe affects yeah. or Right. Um, that's a very good question. I, I, I think assume that the greater the, um, back to the vulnerability, I mean, the more vulnerable you are, the more willing, the more intimacy you have and the more willing you're um, with your partner to engage in bilateral military cooperation, but the less uh, vulnerable you are, maybe there's more distance and you don't um, engage in military cooperation as such. But I'm afraid I didn't look at the sort of the the how the black box of how that is engineered into both states and how that interacts. I just sort of extracted the the micro uh, the macro level of you know if A then B. Or there's a there's a co co correlation, but as opposed to the very um, specific correlation and the dynamics, I'm I have to maybe work that more into the paper, but. Yes. Okay, and all the way back. Oh, hi, my name is Minjin. Um, I'm an intern at the U.S. Korea Institute, and I have a couple of questions for um, Yu So, um, first of all, I was—I don't know if you talked about this in your paper, but I was wondering if the reform of the legal profession um, kind of reflects the Korean population or Korean society's view towards democracy or democratic values, and um, also. question, I think. Um, thank you um, for asking. Um, for the second question first, um, it is a bit difficult to to um, say right now what's the position of the law lawyers in Korea now, but it is true that the numbers has been really increased uh, during the last couple of, last decade, um, let's say, um, and um, the applicants for the the law school, the new law school, or the applicants for the um, current judicial exam um, is shrinking down. And they believe that um, the status of the legal professional, especially practicing attorneys, are uh, economically, or uh, socially, or uh, politically getting maybe um, less important. But um, nevertheless, um, because, you know, Korean society is getting more democratic and it's more globalized and and actually the legal market is is going to be open to the world. So um, there is a lot of demands for the legal services. So uh, we cannot say um, the legal professional's um, status is just getting down because of the, the increase of the number, uh, I would say. Um, and the, um, in the beginning of the formation of the modern um, Korean legal profession, we didn't have uh, the kind of 
concept of modern legal profession like the US or other Western Europe countries. Um, so the government should, I mean, have to um, set a quota of the um, legal profession so that they uh, bring the people and educate the people as a professionals um, uh, for the legal market. Um, so that's the origin of the, um, the cap um, and the restriction of the number of lawyers. But um, as the society getting more is getting more um, democratic and the economy is more, um, you know, thriving, um, there was a big, a huge, huge change um, during the last couple of decades. So that's why the I think the reform has been. Um, process. Okay, right here in the front. My, my question goes to Gloria. What do you see as the prospect of Korea and other countries in the world uh, decoupling from the US dollar? It seems like countries like China that are able to control their currency are doing much better, whereas other countries like Japan that are under a US influence in terms of their economic policy, not only their uh, political system, but um, they're not doing as well. It seems that being, being tied to the U.S. system is, especially in the recent years, more of a liability than, than a benefit. So what do you see as the prospect of Korea and other countries to disconnect from the dollar? Uh, it's interesting for that you bring up that um, association with the dollar linked to the dollar or linked to the U.S. is more of a liability than an um, asset. Um, that is an interesting point, and people have been talking about whether decoupling would be beneficial for Asian economies. Um, there was a talk of decoupling um, and and how that would be beneficial, how that's happening. But as we saw with the global financial crisis, decoupling is not it, w it was not as evident, and Asian economies were very heavily affected. Um, and I'm not sure if um, China's welfare, China's rise, is solely because they are able to um, stay or be very independent of the U.S. currency. Sure, um, their currency value and how they are able to keep it um, devalued is um, a way to stay above or, or have the um, advantage in terms of trade relations. At the same time, China is growing rapidly, and I think um, it has more to do than just being um, able to control its, its currency. Um, how uh, Korea and Japan would do the what, what are the pros prospective um, solutions for them? Well, there are there have been talks about creating a regional currency, uh, maybe like an Asia version of euro, or having more of a um, uh, more kind of equally distributed do um, currency basket. That have been talked about or studied in Japan and Korea and their respective Ministry of Finance. Um, I think maybe a gradual move to equal equal weight would be better. Um, I think adopting Asian Euro, it's ideally attractive, but I'm not sure how politically uh, feasible or attractive it, it would be. I think Japan and China might, ha well, they have a lot to sort out before they uh, kind of try to work out the details of how they would value each uh, respective um, currencies or whether h how they would even name their currency. I don't know. I mean, in Chinese character, I, I think it's all the same character, like Yuan, Yuan or Yen, but um, I, I don't know how how we would call it, and I think there could be a lot of controversy, that's just the beginning of it. Beginning of it. So um, how, what are the solutions for, or prospective uh, potential uh, good resolutions for the currency problems? Um, I don't know, um, to, be, to be frank, and I think that's for the, um, the economies to figure out gradually how to stay away, how to hedge their risk against the dollar fluctuations, how to um, kind of protect themselves, and I think maybe more uh, equally distributed weight in their currency basket would be, uh, at least for now, most economically, politically feasible. Okay, other questions? I'll go in the back to Abe, up here. Uh, Abraham, uh, KEI. Thank you to all four of you for your uh, great presentation. Uh, my comment is actually for th our first two uh, presenters, um, Andrew Kim and, and Jim Bong. Uh, just, uh, one quick question to Andrew. Uh, I have the <laughs> advantage of having read your paper, and so I have uh, uh, some probably some questions that uh, um, is a little more, uh, uh, digs a little deeper. But uh, I'll just ask one question. One is. Um, um, 
I, you, you present an interesting argument about the shifting of preferences and, and views of, toward China and Japan uh, by South Korea. Well, it's not clear, I'm not, you make these sweeping statements about trends, but it's not clear what your methodology is, how you came about uh, coming with these conclusions, because um, I know identity issues is, is very difficult to measure. And in fact, there's a debate about whether you, we, they should be measured or not. But uh, in a paper like this, you know, you can often look to proxies, right, to survey data and or identify key institutions and uh, track the narrative and how it changes over time and things like that. So if, if you can comment a little bit about how you went about coming to these conclusions, what, what methodology you used and what evidence you looked at. Uh, to Gian, it, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, presentation. Uh, one of the uh, important factors, and maybe you did talk about it, and I was just uh, uh, didn't catch it, is is the impact of uh, U.S. alliance on these two countries. And because clearly the common factor here for them, they both have military. U.S. has military presence in both of them. And what seems not to be addressed is how perhaps the U.S. relationship with these countries, um, particularly security relations with these countries, have perhaps had an influence on the, the cooperation between Korea and China. And um, as you probably know, you know, Victor Cha downstairs wrote something like that in his first book. So if you can address uh, that uh, issue, thanks. Um, I guess I'll begin. Uh, that is, I think, um, probably the most important question to ask with respect to my paper, the issue of methodology and how to measure these ideational identity factors and their development. Um, there's a lot of data that I draw from, and a lot of proxies, as you mentioned. Um, first and foremost, there's a, a sort of global public perceptions poll that was conducted by the East Asia Institute in Korea and UChicago here that was conducted in 2008. And a lot of my data in sort of comparing um, Japanese and Korean views of China through the years uh, comes from that. Um, database. And also I look at, uh, and some of these haven't been fully mentioned in the paper, but a lot of sort of personal counts of, you know, how often does xenocentrism appear in various uh, newspapers and publications in Korean media. And uh, also a, a lot of sort of uh, newspaper pulse polls of public opinion, uh, particularly focusing on the, the time periods that I mentioned, you know, uh, after the revelation of the the Kogudo incident and claims of Chinese scholars in the 2003-2004 era. Um, it's, it's difficult to say that this proves anything, and I don't think I can ever fully say that, but um, there's a lot of supporting evidence in the form of, of public opinion and measurement, but there's, there are always issues with measuring public opinion, so I acknowledge those weaknesses, but um, I think this is just a perennial sort of thorn in uh, the way research on identity is conducted, just intrinsic to the nature of, of the topic. Um, thank you very much for your question. Um, I realize that the intuitive model for Northeast Asia is the hub and spokes model you're talking about with the US in the middle and the spokes of alliances branching out with individual alliances. But it might be bias on my part, but I wanted to actually get away from that model and get away from the US centric, the US centricity, and try to actually isolate um, or parse out the effects of the US. Because I noticed that if, if, if it were the case that there were no instances of bilateral military cooperation between Japan and Korea um, until the US stepped in and told us to do so, then I would, I think, have to look at the US. But since I found instances where there were exercises without the influence of the U.S., it made me think, why why did this occur and how did it occur without the U.S.? So I, I, my mindset was maybe even without looking at the U.S., I could look at uh, the dynamics of where the U.S. is not a player and the, how uh, the bilater bilateral military cooperation and instances thereof tended to occur. So I, I fully uh, recognize that the U.S. is a very indispensable actor, but I think I wanted to try and maybe move away from focusing too much on that hub and spokes model and the U.S. being in the center of everything. <laughs>
Damn, I know, right here. Right here. Damien. Thanks, uh, Damien Tompkins, East West Centre. Um, this question is for Andrew and uh, Gian. A um, little bit on a tangent, but uh, Northeast Asia trilateralism between uh, South Korea, Japan, and China. Now, you know, where do you see that going? A little bit of what are the implications for the United States? Um, uh, you know, the, the positive or the negative implications. I think that there's the Secretariat is opening up in Seoul this year for uh, for that trilateral and. Um, the future of where would South Korea like to see that relationship go with both China and Japan, uh, that trilateral relationship? And a quick question for Gloria. Um, U.S. Treasury securities, did you, do you have any data on how much uh, South Korea holds? Um, or, or, or how is South Korean foreign holdings consisted or, or made up or the, are there debt? Thank you very much. Um. So I guess, uh, w were you referring to sort of the prospects of regionalism in Northeast yeah. Asia? Yeah, probably Kent Calder's, right. you know, making a move. And, you know, just as, as I make the case that we can't treat South Korea as a static variable, I also think we can't treat China as a static variable. I think of the three Northeast Asian nations, China is the biggest sort of domestic question mark. And a lot of these contingencies depend on things that don't or do happen within Chinese domestic society. And I think a lot of the, I think, the, the ethnic civic framework that I present is not something that I'm, I'm saying that should be exclusive to Korea, but can be applied in any country um, that deals with issues of plurality and you know the, the dynamics of economic liberalization and the political social spillover effects of that. Um, so I think South I think South Korea, Japan, the United States, we generally have a. Uh, a unified ideal vision for China in that it rises through the existing architecture that has been in place since World War II, that it rises through the institutions and, and the norms that have uh, allowed for China's rise itself up to this point, as well as the prosperity and development of Japan and Korea. Um, and that is the sort of optimistic view uh, for me. Uh, should China sort of continue to remain authoritarian and sort of uh, not really actively contribute to institutions, but more of just sort of in a, in a mercantilistic way, benefit from them and uh, continue to expand its military without being more transparent about its strategic intentions, then I think that uh, you not only have strategic forces, uh, environmental forces emanating from China, pushing Korea, Japan, and the United States closer together, but I also think that it highlights the um, identity differences between China and what has become a, a genuine community um, between the United States, Japan, and Korea. Oh, just to briefly answer. Um, so I guess you didn't uh, hear me when I said I'm not in the business of giving policy, <laughs> right, or predicting oh, the future. Yeah. Right, so just very briefly, um, I think it really depends on which sector you're talking about. Are we talking about the economy, um, or are we talking about security and military? Because I, I focus mostly on security issues. So uh, personally, from where I'm coming from, um, I think uh, there is this obsession still uh, within the region. So the actors of China, uh, South Korea, and Japan on the concept of sovereignty. Um, and with that said, with if you have this undercurrent of uh, a focus on sovereignty, I think it's very hard to uh, establish a very close-knit uh, security uh, framework in the region. Um, and so I, given that I am an emotional optimist, just an intellectual pessimist, I want to say that uh, maybe in uh, even within security, if you look at, say, human security, uh, there are a lot of opportunities out there, so I do see maybe a trilateralism happening in terms of human security. Um, so especially with South Korea being admitted into the OECD DAC, um, so you have all this uh, new ren uh, renewed focus on international development and assistance. So I think South Korea is very excited about the prospects and maybe even making uh, sort of doing pioneering work in that field. Uh, so as long as we have leadership, I think we're good, and human security, fine. But in higher levels of military and security cooperation, I'm 
very tentative to say might look very much like ARF and sort of the lack of impact that that has. Um, but again, I'm I'm not a policy uh, person. Or, I'm not very uh, uh, active in making predictions about the future. So that's as much as I think I can add on that issue. Yes, and, and that's, uh, that's a very important question, how much Korea has U.S. dollars in reserve, and I should be prepared with an exact number with an answer, but I apologize, I don't have, I don't have the exact number. Um, I know that it was quite uh, drastically depleted in the in late 90s with the financial crisis, but it, um, the Korean government has taken measures to, uh, so that it's not depleted as, as drastically, but I don't, I, I'm, I'm really sorry I don't have the exact number, but I can get back to you with more research. Question right here. No. I have a question for Andrew Kim. Uh, I'm David Hong. I'm an intern at CSIS. Uh, you spoke about the history that the two Koreas share uh, from the period of Koguria, and now South Korea feels that it's responsible that it must make the first move when if the regime collapses, and. It feels that if it does not, that China instead will take its place and uh, lead North Korea to become an entity that's closer to them. And to tell you, the tr uh, I'm wondering if you think that the tra tradition between that the, that the two Koreas share, in which North Korea might greatly desire not to become lower than South Korea, might affect their decision, in which they might not y unify with South Korea but turn to become closer with China instead. So are you, are you asking about the prospects of sort of South Korean-led unification as opposed to yeah, China yeah. using this opportunity as a, a, a way to exert greater influence on the Korean Peninsula? That North Korea will choose not to uh, unify with South Korea because because of the, the immense pride that they have with South that against South Korea and will choose to become closer with China instead. Well, I, I think you know, the North Koreans, at least the leadership doesn't have rosy feelings towards either side, the South Korean or the Chinese leadership. Also, um, I think this would be not merely a, an issue amongst this North Korean, South Koreans, and the Chinese, but a regional, if not a global issue. I think the whole world will recognize South Korea's legitimacy in taking the lead in unifying the Korean Peninsula. Which is not to say that China doesn't have legitimate reasons to intervene for the sake of humanitarian and refugee purposes. But I don't think that, and this may be my optimistic assumption, that China would use this as an opportunity to, you know, to, for their, their revisionist moment to sort of exert, re-exert re this sort of xenocentric sphere of influence and establish some sort of permanent presence on the Korean Peninsula that is analogous to the U.S. presence in South Korea. I just don't see that being in the sort of calculation of the Chinese mindset. I think first and foremost, they are domestically inclined and that they worry about foreign policy in the context of domestic issues and they see North Korea in the context of domestic instability and refugee overflows in the collapse scenario. I don't think that they would take the extra step into turning that into some sort of grand strategic ambition to uh, take over the peninsula. But it's definitely, the, the China variable is definitely um, something to consider in, in, in what you're describing. Any other last questions? Well, I just want to thank you all for coming and for joining us for the, our second session. Just a quick reminder, our third session is next week, next uh, Wednesday. We're looking at Korea uh, energy and environment issues. And so if you would please uh, join me in thanking our uh, partic students' participants.